Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the solution to a malarian mess, courtesy of Breitkopf and Hertel. Now, this is a little bit technical, this discussion, but I think it's really interesting for what it tells us about how musical texts are transmitted to us by by the scholarly community who's responsible for this stuff and their publishers. And it's not, there are no enemies here. There are just normal, fallible people. And I think that, you know, a, a mistake has been corrected. Is it a major one? No, but it's a mistake and it's an interesting one. Here's the deal. Mahler's Das Lied von der Erde. Now, Das Lied von der Erde, as we all know, is a total huge masterpiece and when I first started listening to it and collected recordings like all of us, you know, I being a percussionist, I wasn't really a percussionist then, but I, I always listened to differences between recordings, interpretive differences and other differences. And I noticed there was a real difference in text at the moment in the fourth movement of beauty when, you know, the big eruption, when the, the, the young men on horseback come stampeding through the garden where the young women are picking lotus blossoms dreamily and all that stuff. And it sounds like the 1812 overture a little bit. The tune is, ya ta 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 bum 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 ba ta right? Okay, so there's this huge eruption. And that eruption is accompanied by a big pile of percussion. And that pile of percussion in the recordings I heard, which were like the first ones, Bruno Walters, Bernard Heitinks, those, that, that eruption is accompanied by a snare drum and cymbal roll, psh, and then boom, da, 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 dun, 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 like that. And that was fine. I mean, it was what it was. It was very exciting. Then I heard uh, Bernstein's Vienna Phil version. With you know, uh, with Fish Disc Dietrich Fischer Dieskau doing the baritone version of the alto part, which by the way I think is really not a good idea. I think we need an alto there, but that's a whole other discussion, right? So in that place, it, we didn't hear snare drum and suspended cymbal rolls going psh, jump up 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 with the bass drum coming in later. You heard the bass drum where the snare drum and cymbals were, and the cymbal coming in with a roll later, which was. I wish I could play all these to you, but you know the recordings that have them are not. I don't have permission to use them, so I get to do all the parts. So this annoyed me. This bothered me, and when I became a critic many years later, it bothered me even more because I wanted to know what did Mahler really write? What what did he do? Why? Which one of these people is right, and why do they keep changing it? You know, because what happened was the original version which you can find in, in Dover, the Dover edition, has the snare drum and suspended cymbal, then bass drum. And the critical edition, published around 1960 or something like that, Erwin Ratz's version, published by the International Gustav Mahler Gesellschaft, which is a whole nother story. I've done some talks on those people. The original ones weren't bad. The later crew were horrible. They've really screwed up Mahler. Um, about which we'll talk about in a minute. But anyway, anyway, they had the bass drum and then the cymbal. Boom. Okay, great. So I, I turns out, I went to find out where the manuscript was because I was just terribly curious. And it turns out that the manuscript of Das Lied von der Erde and the um, draft score, the final sketch before the clean copy of the manuscript, is held in the Pierpont Morgan Library on Madison Avenue in Manhattan. So I said, well, why don't I go take a look? What shocked me was that no one else had. You know, really, because you'd think a conductor or somebody, even the Mahler freaks, would be curious, right? Why this discrepancy? And, and except that the later people said that they fixed the mistakes of the earlier people, the earlier people, you know, didn't know any better. Well, you know, you can't take their word for it. You have to go look, see what the man wrote. It's right there in black and white. So I went to the Pierpont Morgan Library and I went and looked at it and lo and behold, neither version corresponded to what Mahler wrote. They didn't. What Mahler wrote was triangle and it was a triangle roll, not a bass drum roll. It's ting, 
That's what he wrote. Oh, it's so much better that way. I mean, it's not a huge difference. You know, we make we exaggerate the significance of these things, right? What he wanted was a big, loud eruption. But Mahler's eruptions are not like other composers' eruptions, because Mahler's eruptions tend to be spread out. In other words, a normal composer, you know, when he wanted like a big bang, would have bass, drum, cymbals, triangle, and they'd all go bang together. But Mahler doesn't do that. Mahler often separates the bangs so that you can hear the different layers of texture, the different instruments, each one of which contributes its own quality to the welter of noise that he's producing. You hear it right away at the beginning of the finale of the first symphony. You know, instead of cymbals and bass drum and all that, it's, it's crash, bang, thump, <laughs> you know. You, you hear these different instruments spread out. And that's part of the greatness of Mahler's orchestration. So it matters how that climax is layered in terms of the percussion section. And there it was, plain as day. So I, I copied it. You know, it was on microfilm. I didn't want to touch the manuscript. They would let you do it, but with like you need an armed guard watching you at all times. But microfilm was fine. And I looked also at the at the draft score too to confirm it. And it was very clear. Mahler wanted triangle than symbols. But it, it, I mean, what do you, once you look at it, it's clear, but the notation was a little bit confusing because he was abbreviating, he was abbreviating the instrument list and triangle is TR, you know, period. And bass drum is grossa trommel, is GR, TR, period. And some people just to, for shorthand just call it trommel, which is TR, period. So it's easy to mess it up. It really is, but Mahler actually wrote out triangle or strike somewhere along there. I don't know. It was it was okay. It wasn't hard to figure out what he really wanted. So I copied it and I kept it. And I gave a copy to Charles McCarris, who told me that he tried it out and it worked delightfully. And I gave a copy to Henri Louis de Lagrange and his assistant, Sybil Werner, who was a very fine conductor and a, a big Mahlerian, I mean, a huge Mahlerian, and she was interested in it. And de Lagrange mentioned this in his, his, his Mahler book, the, you know, the final book, which had the discussion of Das Lied von der Erde that um, Sybil assisted him with. And they very kindly gave me credit for pointing out this, this discrepancy. And I was always wondering what would happen. So enter Breitkopf and Hertel the wonderful German music publisher, and here they are. They're doing a new Mahler edition. And you would say, ugh, as if we need one. Well, in fact, we do. We need one because the international Gustav Mahler Gesellschaft, in its second go at most of these symphonies, has just made, I think, a horrendous mess, and their approach is wrong. The approach is to establish what they consider to be a definitive text and then argue endlessly over what order of the movements the six should have or whether Mahler wanted this or that. You know, it's a waste of time. It really is. Now, I haven't seen everything in this, in this series yet. They've so far issued one, three, four, Blumina, you know, the extra movement from the first symphony, and Das Lied von der Erde. But the editorial principle here, I think, was I was so overjoyed, pardon me, I my computer here, here, to hear it articulated, because the editor, who is Christian Rudolf Riedel, writes, in the majority of Gustav Mahler's works, it is not possible to designate unequivocally, unequivocally, pardon me, an ultimate version down to the last detail, or even an or text. Mahler himself aspired lifelong to a final text and pursued a definitive ideal work form from, today, from today's perspective only to be halted by his too early death. In other words, there is no such thing in Mahler symphony scores in, in many cases. There is, only, there is only what he did on the day and his constant efforts at revision. And so you have to weigh, and they say this here very nicely, you have to determine, looking at all the different sources, because every time he played something, he changed tons of stuff. You have to decide whether or not something that he did represented a final intention, or whether it was just something for that circumstance or something he may have been trying out. And in many cases, there's no answer. So ultimately, the correct critical edition would be to give you the legitimate options and let the conductor choose you know, where there are options. And so I'm, I'm really very curious to hear what these people will do with the sixth which is probably the symphony that has the most number of puzzling aspects in that regard. But with Das Lied von der Erde, we're fairly lucky. 
We're lucky because Mahler wrote it, and then he sent it off, he had it copied, he sent it to his publisher, and they produced what's called a Stichvorlage, or a publisher's copy, which Mahler corrected, but he did not live to see the final version in, to, in print, and he never heard the work at all. It was never performed in his lifetime. He just kept tinkering. And so you've got manuscript, the autograph manuscript, you've got the publisher's copy, you've got Mahler's corrections in both, and, and when he worked in one, he didn't necessarily enter those corrections in the other. So, and, and then there are all the other manuscript sources, of which there are several, because Mahler prepared a piano version, and someone else prepared a piano version, a reduction of the orchestral version. There are a large number of sources. And then there are the two scores published by the international Gustav Mahler Gesellschaft. Well, all of which is a very long way of saying that even though this is a comparatively clean job, I just, I just explained, even the clean ones have problems, they finally fixed it. They got it right. And here, I am going to show it to you on page 70-something or other here. 72 or 70. Up oh, here it is. Yeah. On 70, on 72 and 73, where my finger is, here is the triangle. That's the triangle line. The, the line that doesn't have like five staves in musical notes because the triangle doesn't make musical notes. So you could just write the rhythms on a single line. There it is. That is the passage in question, which I am holding up and which you may or may not be able to see, but it doesn't matter. The point is it's triangle, suspended symbol. It's bing, ring, like that. And that's when the bass drum comes in. And it's never been recorded. It has never been recorded. I'm very curious to see if somebody uses this score and parts and actually does it. Now, what do they say about it? And just to, to close up, I mean, what I said is I saw it in the autograph, and that's what they said. They said this is what was clearly in, in Mahler's autograph. And the original, the original copyist who worked with the Stichvorlage for the publisher, um, messed it up. It was just, a, a, he, it was a typograph, it was a typographic, it was a, a, a orthographical mistake. He just got it wrong because the, the, the draft score and Mahler's final score are all consistent on what's supposed to play. And it's really, it's just very, very interesting. And they tell us, by the way, I mean, just in case you're really curious, um, and I know that I'm, I'm stressing you out and with your patience. But here is, um, they, they actually give it to you, the what was actually published originally versus what Mahler actually wrote. And it's right here in the Revisionsbericht, which explains what they do. Here it is. Let me see if I can do this. There it is. See that? That is the first published edition versus Mahler's autograph. And it's very clear, very, very clear. And I'm very happy that somebody finally picked that up. I know it's trivial. I know it doesn't really matter, but it mattered to me. <laughs> it mattered to me. You know, sometimes I think, and this is just me, you know, philosophizing for a minute. When I started working on this and on, you know, like the vibrato question and all that, I said to myself, there are so many people out there who have so many opinions about so many things, and they're very, very general opinions. I would just like to get one answer to one question right. I would be so happy <laughs> just to know one fact which is incontrovertible. And this was one of them. Actually, now I know two. I know about vibrato, and I know about what Mahler really wrote in Das Lied von der Erde. And there may be a few others and whatnot, but, you know, it, it stuns me that nobody looked in all these years with the manuscripts sitting there in the Pierpont Morgan Library with two uh, con contrary scores um, with different readings of the same passage. Nobody looked. And I said to myself, I, I, how many versions could there be? Because it's not like the Sixth Symphony where Mahler conducted it and revised it and conducted it and revised it. And there's 27 different authentic Mahler type versions of it. Not at all. This is a piece he never conducted. He never played it. He never heard it. 
So, and we know that there was editorial intervention in getting it published from Bruno Walter, who was the editor of the original edition and other people. So, so there's no question in this case about what Mahler really wanted. And there's no question about there being conflicting editions stemming from Mahler. That's the point. So here was one case where I said, okay, it's easy. Let's just take a look. And that's the answer. And Breitkopf and Hertel has made it clear. And I was so excited to get this score, which just arrived today. I was the, I ripped it open and took a look and went, yes, <laughs> they got it right. Very, very exciting for little old me. And I'm sharing that with you, and I hope it doesn't bore you to tears. So thank you so much for listening. Keep on listening, because you too may hear anomalous things, and you too might be able to resolve the question through the simple act of doing a little digging, especially now that everything is online. Oh, my. You know, you don't have to be a professional to do this stuff. You can just do it if you have the time and the curiosity. Take care.